Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for everybody who's here. Um, please help us to get rid of all of the distractions from this past week, whether we had a good week or a bad week or even somewhere in the middle. Please help us remember that tonight is about you and we can give our entire week to you, no matter how good or bad or even if it wasn't either or. We can give it all to you and you'll take it because you love us. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, make some noise for Jesus tonight. You can do better than that. Make some noise for Jesus tonight. Amen. Get back to your seat. Hey, don't be a loser. Sit closer to the front, please. I want to see your beautiful faces tonight. Sit closer to the front. You're going to need to for the message. So come on up to the front. Don't sit too far back, okay? Roll that bumper. How we all feeling tonight? We feeling all right? Yeah, yeah come on. Put some, what are the smiles on your faces? Who's excited to be here tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Pastor Dan, and if I haven't met you yet, welcome to Calvary Youth. We're so glad you're hanging out with us tonight. Whether you've been here for a million times, you're a part of our family. If it's your first time, welcome. We want to get a chance to honor you. So after service today, please feel free. Head over to the Welcome Center after your small groups, and we'd love just to connect with you. Put a gift in your hand. Say what's up. Hear about your experience and love to have you be a part of our family here every week. we got stuff going on literally, well, Almost literally every day of the week. We have a youth service happening on Fridays. We have our JBQ and TBQ teams on Saturdays. We have Clean Heart small groups on Sundays. We have outreach teams and worship team. We have our student section on Sundays. We have student leadership. We have our study hall. Who's been to study hall before on Wednesday nights? Yo, if y'all want to learn how to read your Bible, like how do I actually study my Bible, you should come to study hall on Wednesdays. Super dope. We have a lot of awesome stuff, a lot of fun events that we have going on besides the regular here every single week. It's more than just a Friday night. So come hang out and be a part of this community. But speaking of events, we got a really special event coming up soon. Uh, get through that graphic on the screen for me. We got summer camp coming up. Come on, make some noise for summer camp. I said it last week, we have senior high coming up at the end of June, junior high camp coming up at the end of July. Your boy will be preaching at uh, summer camp for our senior high students this year. So if you're at senior high, you're going to be in for a treat. We also have some of our students leading worship at one of the chapels to so come support your friends. It's going to be dope. And uh, there's a lot of really random, random things here that you'll completely understand why there's a baby, and why there's a bucket hat, and what's that tiara doing there for, and why is there a Darth Vader mask? Come find out at summer camp this year. And let me just incentivize it, because here's the thing. Camp is dope. It's an opportunity, kind of like retreat, to get away from the craziness of life here and just hang out with your friends, have an awesome time, but ultimately, Learn more about Jesus and grow closer in your walk with him. We have worship teams come in. There's other people from all over our network that hang out with us. You meet a lot of great people. And uh, I'm going to incentivize this because last week we just kind of promoted it. This week everything opened up. We're promoting it. We're emailing it. It's on social media. It's great. But uh, here's the thing. If you sign up for camp, I, I came up with this on the spot, and Alicia's going to hold me accountable to it. If you sign up for camp before Sunday at midnight, I'm going to put together a camp starter pack for you, free. 
If you're already going to camp, you sign up before Sunday, I'm putting it together for you. And I'm not talking like, oh, cool, you got me bug spray. Bro, I'm going to buy you a nice water bottle for camp. We'll buy you a nice custom maybe youth bucket hat for camp. Maybe give you some exclusive Calvary merch that we're designing for the summer for camp this year. We're going to put it together all for you. If you sign up before Sunday, you'll have a chance to win that. So uh, if you're going to do it, just sign up because we want to know who's going. And here's the reality. Uh, once the spots fill up, Y'all can't go. We had like a dozen people for junior high camp last year that couldn't go to camp because it filled up. So you got to sign up quick. Senior high is coming up sooner than junior high. Sign on up. And if you sign up before June 1st, then anyone who signs up from our church, we're going to put your name in, into like a little random giveaway. And we're going to pay for your ticket for camp this year. 180 bucks, boom, just like that. We're covering it. We'll refund you. You get your money back. It'll be a good time, okay? Your parents will be very happy to hear that. So if you're going to sign up, sign up now. You can talk to your crew pastors more about that or find me afterward. We'd love to give you the info. It's going to be a blast. Don't be a loser and miss out. We're going to have an awesome, awesome time. And, uh, yeah, so that's that. Cool. Anyone have any questions? No, I'm not going to answer them right now anyway. So we're continuing our series tonight on reasonable Doubt. Say it with me. Reasonable doubt. Have you ever heard someone say something that seemed unreasonable to you? Yeah? The goal of this series is to see how it's possible to have questions and doubt while still having faith. We don't need to ignore it. So my encouragement like it was last week was for us to lean into this hard conversation. It's not easy to teach about. It's not easy to talk about. But I believe it's going to help us really take that next step in our journey of faith together. Amen? And so last week we looked at John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, we saw Jesus use doubt to teach his disciples. The big idea from last week was that Jesus can use doubt to disciple us. Jesus can use doubt to disciple us. And we learn that the opposite of faith isn't doubt, it's actually unbelief. But what happens when doubt leads us to unbelief? Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 is where we're going to be hanging out tonight. Let me give you a little bit of context to understand the text that we're going to be diving into this evening. We find ourselves where Jesus is in Galilee. Remember, if I could show you a map, uh, Galilee is in the northern part of the region. And this is where all of the miracles take place in the city of Capernaum and in that whole region. There's a lot of miracles that Jesus is known for in his ministry. And Jesus is finally making his last trip from Galilee to Jerusalem, right? He's going to end up being crucified and, and raised, come back from the dead three days later. This is that time. This is the final journey to Jerusalem. And he just taught his disciples and other people about what it means to have childlike faith. We'll get there in a minute. But then we see this encounter right after that. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, here's what the word of God says. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man came running up to him and kneeling down in front of him, he cried out, good teacher. Come on, say that with me. Say, good teacher. That's important. I need you to take note of that. You need to underline that in your Bible. You need to circle that. Good teacher, what one thing am I required to do to gain eternal life? And Jesus responds. You ever love when Jesus answers a question you didn't ask? <laughs> he goes, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. Underline that. Circle that. Like, whatever you got to do, only God is truly good. You already know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not cheat. And honor your father and your mother. But then the man says to Jesus, not good teacher. He says, teacher. <laughs> We're going somewhere tonight. I have carefully obeyed these laws since my youth. And Jesus fixed his gaze upon the man and with tender love said to him, yet there is still one thing you are lacking. Go and sell all that you have and give that money to the poor. Then all of your treasure 
will be in heaven. After you've done that, come back and walk with me. Completely shocked by Jesus' answer, he turned away and he walked away. Very sad, for he was extremely rich. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the next few moments that we have together around your word. <sighs> Lord, it's, it's stirring up my heart. It was something that I had a hard time sleeping on last night and I was wrestling with today. And Lord, this is just a message that I think all of us is going to be challenged and encouraged by. So help us, Holy Spirit, to really focus in on you for the next few moments together. And I pray, God, that you will be glorified in our conversation, be glorified in the midst of this message tonight. And we give you all of the glory and honor that you're due. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Amen, amen. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that I asked you last week for those of you that weren't here. Who here has doubted before? Raise your hand. If you've ever doubted before. Yeah, that's everybody in the room. Come on. You're lying if you don't have your hand raised. Raise your hand, and you're going to help me out. This We're going to be interactive right now. I need you to raise your hand if you have ever doubted the following statements. Number one, your friend was lying to you when you asked how you looked. Who doubted they were like, oh. You look good. <laughs> Who actually doubted their response? Anyone? Then they were lying to you. We thought they were being honest. Y'all got some good friends, huh? You got some really good friends that are always honest with you, that are never lying or anything. Okay. All right, what about this? Have you ever doubted that <laughs> when everyone was hyping up this restaurant, but it has a two-star review on Yelp? Anyone? Everyone's like, yeah, we're going to go to this restaurant. It's going to be so good. And they got like two stars. And you're like, oh, I don't know if that's actually going to be good or not. No, no. Okay. You guys probably just like eating McDonald's and Chick-fil-A all the time. Awesome. What about this? Have you ever doubted that somebody in your family would actually make it out of a surgery alive? What about that? Anyone? I don't have any loved ones go through like a procedure and you're like, I don't know if they're going to make it or not. Okay. Getting a little more serious here. What about this? Has anyone ever doubted <laughs> that everything you believe is actually worth living for? Anyone? No? I think everyone's wrestled with that at some point. Okay. What about this? Have you ever doubted that Jesus is worth giving up everything for? Ooh. <laughs> guys. Guys. Oh, I'm so excited to preach this message tonight. Okay, if you share these similar feelings, trust me, you're not alone. Doubt can truly be used to push us closer to Jesus in moments of uncertainty. Now, what happens if doubt pushes us away from Jesus? What do we do? Here's this uh, spectrum. We, we went over it last week, and I think I'm going to recap it every single week so it gets drilled into our heads because it's truly, truly helpful to help us understand what doubt really is. Doubt is a catalyst that will push us closer to faith or closer to unbelief. And if we have this spectrum here, we understand that faith is at one end. And at the other end, we maybe have been led to believe growing up that the questions that we have, the, the, the doubts that we have about our faith or about anything is actually the opposite of faith. I'm here to tell you that's a lie. <laughs> the opposite of faith is unbelief. And doubt is this thing in the middle that will push you one way or another. It's going to push you further away from Jesus or push you closer to him. But now, Pastor Dan, what if I enjoy being in the middle? Well, that's bad. You want to know why? Because doubt in of itself is not a bad thing, but when it's relied on, you can't expect it to develop your faith. Doubt that goes unchecked will lead to unbelief, but doubt that is wrestled with usually leads to a stronger faith. And I said it last week to not depend on doubt to develop us alone. Why? Because this is exactly what it means to be double-minded, right? In the beginning of James, the book of James in chapter 1, we see him talking about what it means to not be double-minded. And I think Pastor Kendra, if you were here this past Sunday, did a phenomenal job of giving examples of what it meant to be double-minded. It's this prayer of God, I believe you're going to answer this prayer. I, I'm asking for this thing in my life. But if it doesn't work out, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this instead. That's not faith. That's being double-minded. That's, that's hedging your bet. That's having a backup plan in case this faith thing doesn't work out. And we're going to just find out, we're going to figure out tonight that Jesus is not okay with you having a plan B. 
He is not okay with you having a backup plan in case something doesn't work out. Jesus, here's the big idea for the night, and if you forget everything that I said, it's going to piggyback a little bit on last week. Last week we said that he can use doubt to disciple us. You forget everything I say. You write this down, take a picture of it. Here is what the big idea is for tonight. It's that Jesus can use sacrifice to save us from ourselves. That's a good time to say amen. That's a good time to say amen. It's that Jesus can use sacrifice to save us from ourselves. Oh, Pastor Daniel Jacob Cohen, what are you talking about? We're going to go a little bit deeper. We cool with that? No, y'all want to just quit and go home right now? You good? Okay, you're staying anyway. So I, I know many of you probably heard this story. And again, if you've been here for a while, I apologize. This story is for the new people, okay? Pastor Tim says that all the time. The story is for the new people. Summer 2013, what was that? That was 10 years ago. And I've said it many a time. Maybe some of you were like three when this happened, but it's okay. It's okay. I can't believe it's already been that long. Wow. Um, the story, in a nutshell, is I am a sophomore in high school. I am just starting to come to our youth ministry. I'm fairly new to it. It's my first full summer. We have a lot of opportunity in front of us. We have summer camp, right, that was coming up that year. I'd never been before. We had a missions trip that was happening I'd never been on before. We had a national youth conference that we were going to that I had never been to before. And I had a lot of great opportunities at our youth ministry right here. We're right in the same exact seat that you're sitting in. They just have new cushions and new colors on them. The same exact seat that you're sitting in. I had an opportunity to, to, to make. I had an opportunity to pursue. But the problem was that my high school baseball coach, and if you knew me, I was a big baseball player my entire life. I really enjoyed it. I thought I was going to go pro, and I had my dreams crushed when I was about a freshman in high school and realized I wasn't that good. But I really enjoyed playing ball. And I'm sitting, uh, uh, you know, in this youth ministry, and I remember my coach says to me as we're going into the summertime, right around this time of year, hey, hey, Dan, I, I got an opportunity for you. I'd love for you to play on our summer baseball team. So that way I can basically like prepare you and, and train you for the spot so you can be our starting varsity catcher for the next two years. Right? We're at a pretty big school. We have a pretty good team. I'm going to get some good exposure. I'm going to go play at a D2 or a D3 school, pursue it with my life. That's going to be really awesome, right? And I had this opportunity that I could make. I had an awesome future ahead of me. I had all this potential. Or I had a youth ministry I wanted to get involved with. How what I thought I wanted to do with my life, and little did I know that in those opportunities with our youth group, God was going to reveal some crazy stuff to me in my life. And long story short, in summer 2013, not only did God re reveal what he wanted to do in my life, he gave me the passion to pursue it. And I remember, again, we can talk all day about it, but it was that National Youth Conference where God spoke to me so clearly about pastoral ministry. Again, if I did not make that sacrifice, I don't know if I would be standing before you today. There's a sacrifice that had to have been made for God to reveal something in my future. And again, there was no, there's no certainty. Like, you don't think it was tough? Let's, let's keep it on the same theme for our series. You don't think that I doubted making the decision, look my coach in the face, which is he's kind of a big, scary dude. I mean, have you ever seen him? He's one of the police officers that sits out here in the lobby on Sunday morning. He's a really big like, police officer. That was my baseball coach. Like, he's this big old scary guy. I really valued his opinion. I respected him. And I had to look at him in the face and go, actually, I'm going to not take you up on that offer because I think God has something better for me. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving something that means so much to me at that time. You don't think I doubted in that moment? You don't think I doubted that was the right decision? What are you willing to walk away from to follow Jesus? Does doubt push you closer to him or further away from him? Jesus can use sacrifice to save us from our so it's going to go a little bit deeper tonight. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot in this text. Like, there's a lot here, okay? A lot of thoughts, a lot of things I wanted to cram in. So I'm going to be good and stick to my notes and trust that I did preparing and the Holy Spirit's going to speak. Um, before we look at this text in detail, I need us to understand the context of where we find ourselves. 
didn't read to you where we actually saw happen right before this interaction between Jesus and this rich young ruler. But we saw that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, right? In a few days, he would come into Jerusalem on a donkey, Palm Sunday, you know Palm Sunday, right? Everyone's like, yeah, Jesus, yeah, woo, you're the king. And then like four days later, it's like, kill him, crucify him. I'm like, this is, this is what's about to happen. Jesus is on that last journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. Are y'all with me? Y'all with me? Y'all with me in the back? Y'all with me in the back? Over here, y'all with me in the back? Yeah, 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 you're good? Over here, you guys good? You good? All right, I'm making sure y'all are awake. Good. And um, he's on his way to be crucified. And as he's leaving this place where all these miracles happen, we saw some little children running to him. Matter of fact, if you look at your Bible, and you can fact check me if you want, we see Jesus actually rebuke his disciples for rebuking the children. They're like, get away from Jesus. What are you doing? Get away from him. And Jesus goes, stop it. Let the children come to me. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Theirs is the kingdom. It belongs to them. Whoever does not have their faith like a child, who doesn't open up their arms like a child, they will not enter the kingdom of God. And so Jesus has this, this moment that he's teaching here. I wonder... I wonder if we have something to learn about doubt in this situation. See, these children came to Jesus with no hesitation, almost with a blissful ignorance. And the disciples respond by rebuking them. The response that Jesus gave is truly wild. He's talking about having faith like a child. Remember the spectrum we're talking about, right? If there's faith and there's unbelief, these kids are running with childlike faith. They do not care about any doubt in the world. They couldn't anything less. They're like, no, we don't even care what's behind us. We're following Jesus. We've seen him heal. We've seen him do miracles. We've seen him feed us 5,000 people. We've seen him bring people back from the dead. We want to follow him. We're running to him. No doubt. They're running. Doubt was not a hindrance in following Jesus. But if we pivot real quick, Notice that right after this example, we see almost the exact opposite situation here. The rich young man had a lot to lose. The children didn't. The rich young man had years of experience, years of life behind him. But the children didn't. Yet the same invitation by Jesus was extended to both of them. The rich young man, I even noticed when I was studying the text, he took the same posture as the children by coming to the feet of Jesus and kneeling before him. But their motives could not have been any more different. What do I mean by that? The children wanted Jesus. The man wanted what Jesus could offer him. Y'all, y'all caught that, right? The children came to Jesus running with no hesitation. We just want to sit with him. Jesus blessed them. He said, theirs is the kingdom. You need to have childlike faith. He's talking to adults here. This is what he's doing. And then right after that, we see someone take the same posture, gets on their knees, comes to the feet of Jesus like these little children just did, but their motives are so different. One of them wants Jesus. The other one wants what Jesus can offer them. Yeah, yeah, I gather this information because Jesus came, or the children came to Jesus with no motive. But the rich young man came with an agenda. He kneels at his feet, yet his heart is all out of sorts. Your physical posture does not determine your heart's posture. Y'all caught that, right? And I say it all the time, it's important to close your eyes, to to focus on God. It's important to literally get on your knees in a position of sacrifice. But you have no business falling on your knees if you're not willing to sacrifice all of yourself. This action was right, air quotes, it was right, but that doesn't change the man's heart. And it leads me to believe that we do the same. Falling on our knees is great, but God does say that every knee will bow, right? So our hearts need to be doing the right thing. Our hearts need to be in the right place, not just our physical posture. Just doing the right things doesn't give you the right heart. 
Just doing the right things doesn't give us the right heart. But it goes deeper here. He refers to Jesus at first as a what? Good teacher, right? You caught that, the title. He said, you can put that verse on the screen for me if you don't mind. He refers to Jesus as the good teacher. Y- y'all see that in your Bibles, right? You know I'm not lying to you. I'm not preaching heresy. The man says, good teacher. What must I do to gain eternal life? And that's a very interesting response here. <laughs> Jesus actually quotes the six of the Ten Commandments to him. I don't know if you caught that. But he says all six of these commandments that revolve around you honoring other people and having respect for other people. Y'all know the Ten Commandments, right? You learned that in Sunday school. Y'all heard them before. So they're back in Exodus somewhere, right? The, that Jesus talks about, and if you didn't know that, the first four commands have to deal with your relationship with God. And the last six commands have to deal with your relationship with one another. This is why when Jesus says to love your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but then also to love your neighbor as yourself, the entirety of the law hinges on these two things. Y'all, this makes sense, right? This makes sense? Okay. So when Jesus says these six things, he's intentionally leaving out the commands that deal with God. Want to know why? Because he also says this. He goes, God is the only one that is good. Why do you call me good? This is Jesus talking here, okay? And, and I, man, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get over myself. I thought, I, you ever like read something over and over and you're like, okay, I know this story, whatever, great. Guys, I, I swear, I had like, I thought I had like the one wrong like version of the Bible. Like there was some kind of like typo in here. I couldn't believe what the Holy Spirit showed me. The very next verse, how does the rich young ruler address Jesus? What does he call him? Not good teacher? After Jesus just said, only God is truly good. Why do you call me good? You know what this leads me to believe? Rich young ruler, you're like, Pastor Dan, how's it deal with doubt? Rich young ruler doubted in his heart that Jesus was truly God. Y'all caught that, right? Y'all didn't miss that? I couldn't believe it. I was like, wait, what? And I checked, every, bro, I checked every translation, ESV, NIV, NLT, I checked every translation. He drops the word good. And I thought to myself, you just got caught, bro. You literally just got caught. You just revealed in your heart that the doubt that you had, you truly did not see Jesus as God. And because of that, you're looking to Jesus like a vending machine, whatever you can get from him so you can get eternal life because you already had all this wealth. You already had all this land. You already had everything you thought you needed, but you were still lacking something. You were still looking for something to fill this longing in your heart that clearly all the money in the world couldn't fill. Let's look a little bit closer tonight. It doesn't matter how much you pursue the wealth in your future, how much you pursue the status in your future, how many followers you'll have, how much influence you'll have, whatever possessions you can gather, there's still going to be a longing in your heart for something more that only Jesus, the good teacher, can fill. I'm preaching right now. And I'm led to believe that this man does not believe that Jesus is God. Therefore, he is not willing to sell everything he has to follow him. The real issue here that Jesus is trying to get at has nothing to do with his requirement to get into heaven. He's really trying to address this doubt that's in his heart. The real issue is the man did everything right. He said, I have done all of these things since I was a boy, since my youth. I have never sinned against anyone. But then he did all the right things, and he still didn't know Jesus. Jesus doesn't seem to mind, though. Wouldn't you be offended if you were Jesus? Like, wait a minute, bro, you just called me good. And now I'm just a teacher to you? Like, what? I would have been offended if I was him. Thank God I'm not Jesus. Jesus looks at him, 
I don't know what your translation says, but he looks at him with love, with a tender heart, with compassion. And he replies to a question that he never asked. Despite all of these good deeds, Jesus said that he still lacks something. You want to get a little like, you want to become like a little Bible nerd right now? The same Greek word in this text that is used here, where it talks about the thing that you lack, is actually the same word that is used in the book of Romans chapter 3, okay? This is where Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Talking about that we lack something in and of ourselves. And so Jesus is inviting the man to do something with selling his possessions, right? We see that he's in inviting him to, to, this recogni- to this recognition, to understanding there's still something inside of him despite all of the good deeds that was in lack. And it was the doubt in his heart that went unaddressed. Oh, my goodness. I hope this is going off like a light bulb in somebody's head right now. If it's going over your head, you need, like, you need Jesus, bro. You need to pay attention. This is good. God was showing me this. Like, even on a little side note here, right? If we're understanding the Bible says that he was very wealthy, this would have meant that he would have owned a lot of land, okay? Now, some of my students in here are like, Pastor Dan, what does it mean to own land, okay? Nick, if you owned 17 properties right now and your portfolio was in the tens of millions of dollars, you could cash out in a moment and have all the money you need for the rest of your life. Woo. (laughs) Yeah, he was inviting him to do something. He was inviting him actually to conduct an eternal transaction. He was trying to capture this man's entrepreneurial mindset and get him to care more about stirring up, storing up eternal treasure than earthly treasure, right? Jesus literally says to sell everything you have, give all of that money to the poor, and then all of your treasure will be in heaven. He's saying do a transfer from one account to the next. But because he didn't believe that Jesus was God, wasn't willing to do it. That's crazy. Ben, you can come on up. We're almost done. And uh, man, the crazy part too is the timing of the story, right? Like, like this story happens in, in a matter of a few days, a week, however long it was. Jesus would have been in the absolute pinnacle of his ministry. Absolute pinnacle. He would have seen him in his glory. He would have had a meal with him. He would have seen him crucified and raised again. He would have seen all these things happen firsthand. Yet he could not value the giver of the gift over the gift itself. And remember, there's no backup plan here. Like Jesus doesn't say to the man in the text, hey, um, listen, if, this, if it doesn't work out, why don't you sell enough of your stuff <laughs> To have a backup plan, just in case this whole thing and following me doesn't work, you can have all this to like retire on, have all this to fall back on, everything you need, right? And then, then you're good. No, no, no. He says, sell everything. Empty your possessions and come follow me. There's no double-mindedness here. Jesus wanted everything or nothing. There's no in between. And I want us to close your eyes for a moment Everyone, just work with me here. Close your eyes and think of the most valuable thing you could think of. It's going to be different for everybody. It could be all the money in the world. It could be all the jewelry you want, all the gold, all the diamonds. It could be all the status, the influence, the, the deals, the, the record label. It could be the, the recording contract. It could be the being in, you know, one of the top producers in Hollywood, being the best athlete. Think about whatever it is for you. What's the most valuable thing you can think of? And in the heat of the moment, when you need to make a decision, does doubt push you closer to Jesus where you're willing to give all of that up, or are you going to walk away from him? Does the gift mean more to you than the giver of it? What is God asking you tonight to walk away from? Is it an idol? Is it a relationship? Is it a self-centered career? Is it physical, like eternal wealth? What is he asking you to walk away from? Because it amazes me still how the juxtaposition of both of these stories are paired together right after one another. The invitation was still there, though, for both the children and for the man. 
This is exactly how doubt can push you toward having a stronger faith or in unbelief. But it all depends on who you see Jesus as. If you don't see Jesus as God, you'll never walk away from what you have, what you're trying to pursue in your life. That's the reality of it. And I, I want you to keep your eyes closed as I ask you this question. What, wonder, I wonder what would have happened if the rich young ruler actually accepted this invitation to follow Jesus. What kind of Bible would we be reading right now if somebody that had all of the, the influence, all of the money, all of the power, right? If you owned land back then, if you had all of that wealth, you could do a lot of things. Basically, whatever you want. What would have happened if he sold everything? Would we have been reading about another disciple, one of the greatest potentially disciples that we ever could have seen? And I also wonder what would happen <laughs> if you truly gave Jesus your everything. Not just your habits, not just your help, but if you gave him your whole heart. What have you got to lose? Jesus, can you sacrifice to save us from ourselves? Amen. Close. So op open up your eyes with me. So what are we going to do about it? I said it last week. I'm going to say it again. If you have doubt in your heart, don't pray it away. Please. Would you be so bold to deal with it tonight and next week and as long as it's there? Would you be so bold to deal with it and wrestle with it? And I'm going to do something that's probably going to sound a little crazy to you. That's okay. Because you'll love me anyway. You won't judge me. And if you do, guess what? I won't care. And you laughed. Okay. So I felt when I was praying about this message, I said, God, how do you want us to practically respond to this message tonight? And I'm happy I'm ending a little bit earlier than I normally do. Um, Holy Spirit put on my heart. He said, there are people in this room that need to sell some land tonight. There are people in this room that are at the point in their faith that they're actually willing to walk away from the treasure that they're pursuing and storing up on this earth and they're willing to sell it and walk away from it to follow me. And I think it's easy for us to say, we're gonna pick up our cross and follow Jesus and we do really well for a while and then we just get tired or like we, we lose the appeal of like, oh, following Jesus and like I'm not feeling like doing that right now and so we can kind of get like sidetracked and then we start like not focusing on the things that matter in heaven and we start focusing on the things that we think are important here on earth and we lose focus and the Holy Spirit said to me tonight that we need to regain that focus he said that we need to sell some land we need to sell some possessions and we need to actually pursue Jesus with not just part of our hearts the easy part but the part where it's actually gonna cost us something. So you know how we're practically going to illustrate this? You guys, if you're sitting in this room, you have some little uh, prayer request cards in front of you, right, in that pew? Yeah, so you're gonna take one of those, you're gonna rip one of those off, and uh, there are some pens that are there as well. And on the back of that prayer request card, re prayer request card I need you to write down on the back of that what you're willing to sell to follow Jesus. I'm not talking about literally. I'm not talking about like, Pastor Dan, like, here are my shoes. I'm going to sell them to follow Jesus right now, right? I'm not talking about like, I'm going to give you my iPhone. Like, I'm not talking practically, like, like literally. I'm talking, what are you willing to walk away from? For some of you, it may be wealth. Like, some of you might be in here like, yo, I'm on my grind. I'm going to work and get as much money as I can. I'm going to do my thing and provide, right? I imagine that's not many of us. <laughs> But you know what that is. You know it's a relationship, you know it's status, you know it's, it's a career, you know it's a future that you've been dreaming about. 
And would you be so bold to say, and let me, let me say it right now, don't write a check you can't cash. I'm gonna be completely honest. There is no judgment from me. If you sit in your seat and go, Pastor Dan, I have a good life or the life that I think I'm pursuing is good. I'm not gonna sell nothing. I'm gonna stay in my seat. That's between you and God, man. Like I, I, there's, this, there's clearly something happening. There's some doubt that you're wrestling with and that's good. You're actually wrestling with maybe, maybe I don't believe that Jesus is God. But trust me, when you see that Jesus is worth following, when you see that he's worth leaving everything behind for to follow, you'll sell whatever you got, bro. I don't know. I don't know how much money I would have acquired, how much wealth I would have acquired by now, what my life would look like different if I didn't truly surrender my life to Jesus and follow him wholeheartedly. But I'm so grateful I made that decision when I was young. Because there are so many people that look back to your age and go, I wish, I wish I would have taken it seriously then. Are you willing to make an eternal transaction tonight? To sell everything to follow Jesus. He leaves the invitation for you regardless if you say yes or no. But we decide if battling with the doubt is worth it. Remember that doubt is reasonable more times than not. So let's wrestle with it before it's too late and pushes us away completely. Jesus can sacrifice, can use sacrifice to save us from ourselves. Amen. So some of our youth staff are going to make their way forward right now. We don't need to get super spiritual and close our eyes. We're all young adults in this room, right? You guys are mature. I believe in you. And when you're ready to make that, I was almost going to like bring a big old like offering box. You know what I mean? I was going to make a big old like checkbook, put it up front and go drop this in the piggy bank. Like what are you willing to sell? What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to make a transaction for? If you're willing to make a sale tonight and walk away from everything, to follow Jesus, again, lights are down. It's no one else's business but you. No one else is going to be standing there between you and God when you're answering to him one day. It's you. You come to the front and you drop it right here. And we're going to collect a lot of earthly wealth tonight and see the kingdom of heaven advanced and the kingdom of hell shudder in fear. Amen. I'm going to pray. You're going to start making your way forward. Worship team is going to lead us, and we're going to respond, okay? So with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, Father, we thank you for this night. Lord, I'm grateful that you're a God who says to us, who challenges us to sell everything we have to follow you. You're a God that we serve. You're, you're the God who is able to take what we have here on this earth that we think means so much to us now in this lifetime. And God, you're willing to tell us to make the greatest transaction to say, give it to me. Just give me your whole heart. Oh God, it burdens my heart to see young people half in and half out. God, I wonder how different our world would look. I wonder how different our church and our youth ministry would look. I wonder how different our schools would look if we truly sold everything to follow you. God, help us not to care more about the things on this earth that are going to perish, that are going to wash away, that we can't take with us into eternity. Help us to care more about pleasing you, about honoring you, because Jesus, you are God, you are the good teacher, and you're willing to, invita to extend us an invitation to give us an invite even if it means we're going to reject it. Help us to see you as God tonight and to sell everything we have to follow you. Stir in our hearts, Lord, these things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.